Okay, I'm going to get us started, even as folks are trickling in. Good afternoon, and welcome to this session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. This afternoon, we will speak with Northwestern University's Deborah Cohen about her new book, Last Call at the Hotel Imperial, The Reporters Who Took on a World at War. And we're being joined by Princeton's David Greenberg. A warm welcome to both of you to the Washington History Seminar. And David's a Wilson alum, so welcome back. And Deborah, hopefully someday you'll be a Wilson alum, so I can welcome you back in that way as well. I'm Christian Osterman. I direct the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program, and I have the pleasure uh, to co-chair the seminar series with Eric Arneson of the National History Center, the American Historical Association, and George Washington University. Today, Eric will introduce our speakers and moderate the discussion. As many of you know, the Washington History Seminar is a collaborative effort of two organizations the American Historical Association and the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program. For well more than a decade, the seminar has served as a nonpartisan forum to discuss new historical insights, findings, and publications, which is central to the mission of both of our organizations. Behind the scenes, there are two individuals who helped produce this event, Rachel Wheatley for the AHA and Peter Bierstecker for the Wilson Center. Our thanks to both of them. We'd like to acknowledge our supporters, our donors, and we welcome your support. Details about how to support the seminar, which is really a, a, a pro bono effort on both of our parts on a shoestring budget, so donations are always welcome. Information, details are available in the chat right now or simply go to our institutional websites um, and you'll have the information there. Finally, before I turn the discussion over to um, Eric, um, uh, a invitation to join us next week, but not Monday, on Thursday, October 13, for a conversation about Tina Lahav's new book, The Only Woman in the Room, Golda Meir and Her Path to Power. One uh, more quick uh, uh, technical explanation. Today's session will be recorded and will soon appear on our respective organizations' websites for the Q&A part of this webinar. Uh, we, we ask that you please use the raised hand function in the Zoom functionality. If you'd like to ask a question, once you press that button, you'll be put into a queue and the moderator will call on you in due course. You will receive a prompt then to unmute yourself. Please do that, otherwise we won't be able to, um, to hear you. Uh, you can get in line uh, starting now. Um, so feel free to line up for your question or comment. You can also use the Q&A function in the Zoom menu to, um, to write in a question, to post a question, and Eric will put it to our panelists. And with that, I'll turn it over to Eric. Eric, Zoom room is all yours. Thank you very much, Christian, and uh, welcome to our participants. Welcome to those of you who are watching. Today's format uh, is slightly different. Uh, we are going to have an in-conversation format uh, with uh, David Greenberg uh, speaking with Deborah Cohen uh, about this book uh, in some depth. But first, uh, our author, uh, an introduction. Deborah Cohen is the Richard W. Leopold Professor of History, and she's chair of the History Department at Northwestern University. Her interests run the methodological gamut from social science-inspired comparative history to biography. She's the author of The War Comes Home, Disabled Veterans in Britain and Germany, 1914 to 1939, published in 2001, Household Gods, The British and Their Possessions, 2006, uh, and Family Secrets, Shame and Privacy in Modern Britain, published in 2013. Her books have been awarded the Forkosh, Charlin, and Stansky Prizes, and she's had fellowships from the Mellon Foundation, the National Humanities Center, the Cullum Center at New York Public Library, the ACLS, uh, the John Simon uh, Guggenheim Memorial Foundation as well. She writes regularly for The Atlantic on subjects ranging from war photography to punk rock. Today, we'll be discussing her most recent book, Last Call at the Hotel Imperial, the Reporters Who Took On a World at War, published by Random House this year. Deborah, great to have you with us. The screen's yours. Thank you so much, um, Eric, for that kind introduction. And thank you also to Christian 
um, Osterman for inviting me to talk about the book um, at the Washington History Seminar. Thank you to Rachel Wheatley, especially for coordinating the event. And I'm really grateful to David Greenberg for joining me in the conversation. Um, so Eric's asked me briefly to introduce the book. So I'm going to do that for the next 10 minutes and then we'll turn to the conversational format and Q&A. Um, last call at the Hotel Imperial is about a group of friends and sometimes rivals who became some of the most celebrated American foreign correspondents of their day. John Gunther, Dorothy Thompson, H.R. Knickerbocker, and Vincent Sheehan. Today their names aren't at all well known, but in their own era, they were celebrities on an international stage, as famous as their lost generation counterparts, F. Scott Fitzgerald and Ernest Hemingway. My book is about the rise of fascism. It's about the challenge that anti-colonial nationalists, such as Gandhi and Nehru, posed to the tottering European empires. It's about a journalism of warning that broke the rules about objectivity and reporting. And it's about a moment when American foreign correspondents were the kings of the hill. It's about what journalists didn't see, at least at first, what they argued about, and what they got wrong, the nature, for instance, of modern dictatorship. It's also about what they came to understand, some of it eerily prescient in our own moment, a looming refugee crisis, the paradoxical internationalism of fascist politicians who staked their careers on anti-internationalism. At a time when appeasement and isolationism held sway, much of what Americans eventually came to know about the crack up of European democracies and the rise of the dictators go to their reporting. On another level, the book is also about the relationship between inner lives and geopolitics from the 1920s through the 1940s. This was a period when authoritarianism and two world wars breached the barrier between the public and the private spheres. And the foreign correspondents in my book, um, influenced in part by the ambient Freudianism of their era, put this phenomenon front and center. They came to see that the individual leader counted for nearly everything, that these were the men who were fomenting the world crisis, to report on a Hitler or a Mussolini or a Stalin required understanding what had made the man who he was. So probing the connections uh, between the interior worlds of family life, sexuality and marriage and the outer worlds of politics and international relations. But what started as a rather arm's length analysis on the part of these journalists very soon became personal. While they started off trying to explain the psychopathology of leaders, soon they found themselves uh, channeling these own dynamics in their own relationships. It was as if the worldwide crisis had gotten inside of them. So what I want to start, um, what I want to do is show you some pictures of these folks in case you don't know, uh, haven't read the book, don't know these people, so you can get a sort of, um, have fixed them in mind. Okay, John Gunther. Um, John Gunther got his start as a cub reporter on the city's most prestigious afternoon daily, the Chicago uh, Daily News, covering gangster shootouts and Rotary Club luncheons and things like that. He left Chicago for Europe in 1924, and he spent the next 12 years in near constant travel, shooting between Vienna, Damascus, Cairo, Jerusalem, and Berlin, just to name a few of his most frequent routes. The book that made his name was Inside Europe, published in 1936, um, which was a taboo breaking look at the um, dictators rising across the European continent. Between the mid 1930s and 1950s, and the end of the 1950s, John Gunther had more US bestsellers than any uh, author, than uh, save the romance novelist, um, Daphne du Maurier. Among Gunther's closest friends were Dorothy Thompson, H.R. Knickerbocker, and Vincent Sheehan. Red-haired and wiry, H.R. Knickerbocker had sought out of Yoakum, Texas, snapping at facts like a terrier. He won the Pulitzer Prize in 1931 for his reporting on Stalin's first five-year plan. He interviewed everybody who was anyone 
from Stalin's mother, whom he located in a hamlet in the Caucasus, to Hitler, to Mussolini, whom he interviewed four times. And it was said that um, Knickerbocker's dispatches were the only foreign reports that Mussolini bothered to read all of the way through. And this wonderful picture, Knickerbocker with Stalin's mother. The third figure, Vincent Sheehan, otherwise known by his nickname as Jimmy Sheehan, which is how I'll refer to him. By the time that Jimmy Sheehan published his memoir, Personal History, in 1935, he was already well known for his reporting exploits in the Moroccan wars of the mid-1920s and for his anti-colonial views. The question that propelled Sheehan's memoir was, as he put it, quote, how the individual person enmeshes with society, with the historical process of which he is a part. Personal history would set a generational template for the way to live an engaged life. And then the fourth figure, Dorothy Thompson. Dorothy Thompson was the first American woman to lead a major overseas news bureau, which was a distinction that she always disdained for the it's see what the little darling has done now attitude. By the late 1930s, Thompson had an estimated audience of eight to 10 million people for her thrice weekly syndicated on the record column. Um, three fifths of those columns by the late 30s were devoted to her anti-Nazi crusade. Her signature was an unabashedly emotional style. Critics quipped that she was the only woman in America to have her menopause in public and to make it pay. But as Jimmy Sheehan liked to say, when FDR wanted to sway opinion, it was Dorothy whom he called. And this is Thompson on the cover of Time magazine in June of 1939. Um, the editors of Time described Thompson alongside Eleanor Roosevelt as the most influential woman in America. So these journalists, um, these four reporters, together with John Frank, Gunther's wife, Frances, who was herself a sometimes foreign correspondent, are the main figures of my book, um, with many other journalists like Bill Shire, Edward R. Murrow, The New Yorker's Emily Hahn as the supporting players. So I wanted just to close this introduction by situating the historiographic contribution of the book. The interwar years, I'm arguing, are shot through with linkages between inner life and geopolitics. In a very real sense, the boundaries between these spheres collapsed. That was what Virginia Woolf meant in Three Guineas, in 19, published in 1938, when she wrote of the inseparable interconnections, as she puts it, between the tyrannies and servilities of the public and the private world. And it was also what F. Scott Fitzgerald saw when he explained his wife Zelda's nervous breakdown, which started a few months after the Wall Street crash of 1929 as the societal collapse in miniature. Thanks to the work of Frank, Frank Castigliola, Ilaria Scalia, and David Greenberg, among others, we have a much better understanding of the emotional lives of statesmen and the public consequences of private passions. And this is part of the shared ground between the new international history and the history of the emotions. But there's quite a lot more of the shared ground possible, especially given one of the really significant accomplishments of international history, which is to expand the range of actors beyond diplomats and statesmen to non-governmental organizations and people who join the League of Nations unions and indeed transnational currents of opinion broadly defined. So I see the yield in the shared terrain between international history and the history of emotions is twofold. First of all, what I wanted to do was to open up the history of emotions beyond the intimate and domestic subjects where it's largely been conducted. This is especially important for 20th century topics, given how pervasive and politically consequential the slippage between the personal and the geopolitical was. One of the arguments I'm making, for instance, is that the drive to openness, um, to my mind, emblemized by the modern tell-all memoir, really owes its origins to the 1930s rather than to the liberationist 1970s or the narcissistic 1990s, um, which are the more sort of conventional ways to explain what has happened. Um, in other words, what I'm saying is that the conviction born of the hellish world of the 1930s and 1940s, that the individual needed defending, um, that the full range of human 
experiences had to be told is one of those kind of gains, yields that you see in the overlap between kind of thinking about the history of private life and also the history of international affairs. And second, I hope that the book encourages more work into the publics who are the audiences for the last call journalists. These were mass global audiences of millions, and they were in some cases also new and newly democratic populaces. And I think in a way, we're really just starting to understand them through the work of scholars such as Michael Schutzen, David Allen, Michaela Hernicke Moore, Sean Nicholas, and Madeline, Madeline Lugley. We can see the interwar period as the next stage in Benedict Anderson's famous argument in imagined communities, not just that transatlantic communities are forged through newspapers and novels as in the 19th century, but now that something new is happening, that the boundaries between inner and outer life are dissolving. People come to foreign policy ideas, not just as a matter of rational calculation or ideological worldviews, but as a matter of feeling. The media serves as the means of prying open their insides. And in a sense, it's small wonder that both Dorothy Thompson and H.R. Knickerbocker were the children of ministers. Subjectivity, they would find, sold just as well as objectivity, if not better. So thank you. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Thanks so much, Deborah. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome David Greenberg, Professor of History and Journalism and Media Studies at Rutgers University. He's writing a biography of Congressman John Lewis for Simon & Schuster, a book that I am very anxious for him to finish so I can read it and learn from it. He is the author and or editor of a number of books in American history and politics, including Nixon's Shadow, The History of an Image, published in 2003, Republic of Spin, An Inside History of the American Presidency, published in 2016, and Calvin Coolidge, published in 2006. He's also co-editor of Alan Brinkley, A Life in History, published in 2019. Formerly acting editor of the New Republic and columnist for Slate, he now writes for Politico, among many other scholarly and popular publications. He holds a PhD in history from Columbia University and lives with his family in Manhattan. And I should point out, David is a former Wilson Fellow. David, welcome back to the Washington History Seminar. Thank you, Eric and, and Christian. And uh, thank you, Deborah, for the opportunity to comment on this wonderful book. If our audience members haven't read it, um, I really recommend it uh, enthusiastically. Um, it is both a historiographical contribution as Deborah outlined at the end, uh, but also a sort of consummate group biography and um, uh, really the story of four fascinating characters that can be read and uh, appreciated, you know, even by by non-historians or those those detached from those um, you know scholarly uh, uh, debates and sets of questions. And you know, Deborah, you framed it as a matter uh, uh, sort of of bringing together international history and the history of the emotions. Um, in my notes, I had something a similar but a little bit different um, thinking about the balance between biography and intellectual history. Um, in, in some ways did you know a, a, a comparable uh, set of counterpoints there. Um, you know I think the the uh, genre of the group biography has since the wise men and the metaphysical club become one that is increasingly uh, legitimate, we might say, and, and appealing to readers and also to writers, to historians, because sometimes the individual biography can feel like just taking too, uh, too narrow a slice and the group biography gives us a bit sort of wider range to explore uh, a variety of intellectual currents or political developments of a given era. Um, and I was also, I mean, in some ways your opening remarks anticipated and even answered some of my questions. So I'll, I'll just have to uh, elaborate or, or push into slightly new ones. But, you know, it, it seems to me that you do believe as the subjects of your book believe that the individual character matters. So that getting into their sex lives, their marriages, their friendships is not just a matter of making them seem more human for the reader to understand them uh, and want to keep turning the pages, 
uh, but also that this gives us some insight into uh, the formation of their ideas and of their behaviors that had historical consequence. Um, so, you know, one question to think about that we can sort of put aside, I'll, I'll try to keep my remarks generally uh, not too long, um, but one question for the offing is how, how do we get that balance right? It's something I struggle with in Republic of Spin, my last book, I tried to give a little sketch of each of the many figures I wrote about because I wanted to do that, but I didn't want to fall into um, the perils. And you know, I if if Luke Menand is is in our audience, forgive me, but of Menandism, um, I say that not so much about the Metaphysical Club, but his most recent book on the Cold War, uh, which for all its you know prodigious virtues. Um, often seem to spend more time on how Sartre you know, came up with an idea in the cafe than interrogating or unpacking the idea itself, or Isaiah Berlin's meeting with Anna Akhmatova rather than a close exegesis of the, the essays on liberty. That is, you know, is, is there a danger of substituting or relying too much on the personal anecdote sort of at the expense of the intellectual work that needs to be done to both uh, uh, explain the ideas and situate them in their um, social, cultural, political, intellectual context. Um, I hope it's not indulgent uh, for me to say that I was delighted when this book came out for many reasons, but among them is I had, in order to write this John Lewis book, put aside another book I'd been thinking of writing that was in some ways quite similar. Um, I was planning to look at the transformation of liberalism, which is actually a word I didn't hear you mention. So that's a, a, another one we might talk about in the 1930s and during World War II. And I was going to look at a number of interventionist liberals, including Dorothy Thompson. Um, my other characters were not your characters. I was gonna look at Archibald McLeish, Max Lerner, Ralph Bunch, possibly Felix Frankfurter. I was not quite sure how, how many would fit into my group biography, but probably like yours, there would be a central group of four or so, and then some uh, peripheral ones. Um, because I think in this period, liberalism in America goes through an important transformation and people often, completely misunderstand um, and use this term Cold War liberalism. But what emerges in the Cold War is really emerged in the 30s and 40s in response both to communism and to fascism um, and recenters, I think, American liberalism around freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of thought, freedom from coercion and tyranny, anti-discrimination in race, religion, nationality. So, you know, when you talk about Dorothy Thompson's anti-communism, that seems to me fully of a piece uh, with, with the liberalism of FDR that's now been ushered in kind of replacing the earlier progressive era liberalism. Um, when we see John Gunther's uh, Inside USA, which is actually how I was introduced to Gunther as a figure or how I first discovered him, uh, you talk about his affinity, its affinities with uh, Gunnar Myrdal's American Dilemma, which Ralph Bunch also worked on, and how anti-racism, not in its current fashionable meaning, but in its traditional meaning of opposing racism, um, was also a part of liberalism uh, in, in this 30s and 40s uh, variety. We see anti-fascism as part of this. Zionism as part of this, anti-imperialism. Um, and then I would say two other things could also be seen as part of this form of liberalism, which again, I think does kind of uh, fit with what you're saying because they're both things that support the importance of the individual, which of course is at the center of liberalism. One is journalism itself. Um, and if you compare the, the role that journalism plays in an open society, 
like the United States compare to its purely propagandistic function uh, in either a Soviet or a Nazi context, um, you see its importance. And yet there's sort of a, a dilemma that these journalists face of when journalism reportage providing Americans and other audiences with the information that they need to know is sufficient and when it needs to become something more like advocacy or even propaganda. And there are times where Dorothy Thompson talks about creating propaganda. Um, and I think this was a dilemma for all of them. You talked about the dilemma of objectivity, which I would say is, I would frame a bit differently. I think objectivity is, is not so much the problem, but the answer because objectivity as it developed in the 20s was not, a, uh, was not the problem to which subjective journalism arose. Subjective journalism was the problem to which the objective method arose. Um, objectivity was never about uh, both sidesism as we call it today. That was always a corruption, not the consummation of objective journalism, which was meant to admit, identify, the fact that individuals had biases and then to try to account for them and to some degree neutralize them in thinking about what is, what is getting at the truth. And the danger of straying too far was it could take you into propaganda and away from truth. So something else we could, we could um, talk about that balance between detachment and engagement would be another way of thinking about it. And then finally, I think psychoanalysis itself might be seen as a cornerstone of liberalism, precisely because of its emphasis on the individual, on the individual's capacity for choice, agency, as historians like to say. It may not be a coincidence that as our society has moved away from depth psychology, psychodynamic understandings of the mind and toward the quick fixes of psychopharmacology or 40 session cognitive behavioral therapies. Uh, we've also seen historians, I think, move away from an appreciation of individual agency, of the role of the individual and move back toward a kind of maybe watered down Marxism, Marxian kind of uh, attribution of most of it to great social forces. And again, obviously I think we all know that history is an interplay between the two. Individuals can't remake the world at will and individuals also do matter. But again, how we get that balance right, I think is a question you know, both for historians and for anyone who, who's thinking about causation and uh, uh, causality in, in the world. So uh, there's sort of a lot of comments kind of st stemming in part from my own flirtation with an exploration of some of these questions, but coming at it in a substantially different way. I guess maybe a question to start with is with your characters, Deborah, do you think of them as liberals? Do you, did, did, did they think of themselves uh, as liberals and was liberalism part of what they thought they were fighting for or would they not have seen it that way or used that word or framed it that way at all? It's, first of all, thank you so much for those comments. You really are the perfect person <laughs> to be commenting on the book and I'm looking forward to, to talking about it. So Dorothy Thompson, John Gunther calls Dorothy Thompson a uh, liberal conservative or a conservative liberal. And by that, he means that she's anti-statist. So, you know, she basically loathes the New Deal and thinks that worries a lot in the way that a 19th century liberal would about the corrupting influence of um, state programs of all sorts. On the other hand, in, and you put this very well in her advocacy for free speech, for the rights of the individual in foreign and the sort of foreign picture and the crusade both against fascism and against communism 
she's absolutely a liberal. Um, Sheehan would have called himself, uh, you know, at various points, a socialist. He, between socialist and, and communist, he sort of, you know, hangs in the wind between those things. Um, I think in a lot of ways, Sheehan too was, he was much friendlier to state action, but he also preserves the kind of 19th century liberal. John Gunther is unabashedly a liberal. So this is, it's to the degree of, you know, I think he thinks about his own individual makeup, which is fair-minded, willing to listen to both sides. Um, he's a supporter of the Austrian Social Democrats. He's married to a woman who describes herself as a Marxist or as a communist or as a socialist, depending upon the moment, um, his first wife, Frances um, Feynman Gunther. And then finally, Knickerbocker, I would say, was probably mostly conservative. I mean, he's a little tricky to pin down on that spectrum, but I think that you're right in pointing to the ways in which their, their concerns and the centrality of the press to their concerns could help you to tell a story of liberalism. And for me, that was mostly focused on the, the defense of the individual, the Dorothy Thompson's defense of democracy. I mean, one of the things that she says about democracy that I actually constantly think about is where are the people who are willing to defend democracy as democracy? How can we rally the people in favor of democracy in which he sees being ha happening so efficiently with fascism and communism? So can I also come back to your first point? Is that all right? Uh, um, absolutely, go ahead, yeah. So. It's a really, so the, so just to, to, the first point was the question about how do we balance the context and the focus on the individuals, which I think is a really crucial question for anyone who takes up centering a few individuals at the heart of a story. And as you could tell me- Can, can I interrupt one? Yeah, yeah. Thing, and, and also, yeah, the, their ideas and actions. So- Absolutely. That, right. 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 And I think maybe you could tell this from my opening comments that at the very end of writing the book, or maybe about it three quarters of the way through, what I really wished is that I knew a lot more about their publics. And increasingly, I found, you know, writing for audiences of millions, presumably persuasively for a fair number of those people and figuring out the balance between. So is this a group of people who are trying to get other their fellow citizens interested in questions that they're not interested in or are they drawing on a set of preoccupations that people have say by the that americans have by the 1930s so that by the time that i finished the book i wish that i knew a lot more about that and i have various ideas about how you can research it and madeline lugley who i referred to is doing a lot of this work as are a number of other historians but for me, um, in a sense, precisely because this group of people put personal life really at the heart of their journalistic endeavor, um, that's very obviously true for Gunther, who's running around um, in the research for Inside Europe, trying to gather the information about what kind of venereal disease editor has, um, and using the book in a way as a means of reporting all the stuff that he wishes that he could put in his newspaper uh, work. But of course, his editors, he knows, will never permit that. Um, and then whose diaries are just slipping always into a kind of meditation on the relationship between the stories that he's seeing in his own marriage. I mean, it's just shot through all of this work. Same thing for Tom Thompson, actually, too. Um, so for them, those concerns were so front and center that they inevitably have to become part of the narrative. They're not extraneous in any way, right? They're absolutely core because they were at the core of their journalistic work. And in a sense, of course, I, as the historian coming to them, turn their own lens on themselves, which is what they're doing as well. So I hope that, does that help in terms of how I was thinking about it. Yes, no, absolutely. And I guess I was not really asking question uh, 
and, and the first part that, that I think has a, a an easy way of answering, but with with any of these sort of delightful, uh, dishy uh, sexual anecdotes, sort of there probably arises the question like, well, how much does this further my understanding of you know Gunther or Nick or any of them? And how much is this just like it's another good it's another good scene, another good yeah. vignette to put so in? What, and the latter isn't isn't. I mean, look, as academics, we sometimes uh, poo poo the latter. That, that, that's a perfectly legitimate criterion when you're writing a book for inclusion. Um, but I think you know sometimes you, you readers may have the suspicion. Well, is you know is this whole um, argument that getting deep into their sex lives is, is really going to illuminate their journalism kind of just a uh, pretext for writing a more fun uh, uh, prurient book um, and I'm not I'm not making that yeah. accusation this thing no, the, no, no, the no, writer no, just, like I yeah. I struggle with these kinds of things um, and like uh, you know which which impulse, I mean, you could get Freudian, like, do you go with your id or your superego, you know, like. <laughs> so I think that in the case, I see it, I, I can see the dilemma if you had a set of subjects for whom this was not central to their thought. Right. But because with the Gunthers, you have them sitting around asking questions like, to what extent is a empire like a marriage? Um, which is what Frances Gunther is asking her husband, you know, is my colonial, am I, is my freedom struggle like Nehru's freedom struggle? Um, am I over throwing off my colonial overlord, but, or do I need my colonial <laughs> overlord? So those connections are being made explicitly by the subjects. And in a sense, I'm not quite sure how you could write about them to turn your question on its head. I'm not sure how you could write about their ideas without understanding the depth of the commitment to personal life as a, a kind of key to not just personal motivation, but actually collective motivation. And that that's what's really crucial. And that that's, you know, there are two parts to it. One of them is coming to the set of ideas, which as I said, is filtered through, in the case of the Gunthers, a kind of ambient Freudianism, also for Thompson to some extent, but for someone like Sheehan who explicitly rejects Freudianism, so he's you know stuck in a sanatorium in Switzerland where the you know various mind doctors come and try to psychoanalyze analyze him and say this is all just the most preposterous nonsense, or as he puts it about the Weimar Republic, psychoanalysis is a symptom of disease, not a sign of intellectual activity, which I love as a quote. Um, his, it, he's making a different point with which amounts to the same thing, which is that there's the line between the individual and the collective has basically disintegrated and that he has a kind of porosity to the outside world so much so that he believes that he can actually predict the future. He knows where, you know, the next event is going to happen. He's able to predict what's going to happen because he actually feels it in a corporal sense. And so on the one hand, this sounds like complete nonsense. On the other hand, he is, he is of course there sitting on the spot precisely because he, can, he knows what's going to happen. So it's a kind of enhanced, it's an enhanced version of the reporter's hunch or the reporter's second sense. You have to know where you should be on the spot in order to get the story. Except for here, it's you know a magnification of the, the ways for many people, and not just the reporters, I think they're the leading edge, but for many people, this line between inner life and geopolitics is absolutely disintegrating through the 30s. Right, and even though he, you know, rejects Freud, he, um, you know, he writes his personal history, his That's memoir right. book. Um, I'm getting some other Zoom thing coming in. Oops. He's gone, but I'll just say, yes, he writes a book called Personal History um, because as he says to John Gunther, all history is personal. I can't tell it any other way. 
um, while David is is coming back on, I think that so. In other words, hi, David, I'm just continuing answering the question about Sheehan, which is to say that I think the dilemma that you point to, um, for me, was a dilemma about what is extraneous to this uh, to this particular argument, this, this set of events. So because they were so interested in personal life, the archives are full of incredible amounts of revelations about people who are not in this book, who are you know, peripheral to the story, things mm -hmm. that happen to them that are not important to the story that I'm telling. And so for me, that was easy, right? That all of that stuff is out. Some of it is probably, you know, certainly was libelous at the time. Um, but where the, where what you see is actually the thinking in action, the attempt to go on the one hand to diagnose the individual leader, that turning into an investigation of the inner life of the journalist or the writer themselves, and then magnified out, of course, to an audience, which then takes up this terminology. Certainly this happens with Sheehan's personal history, where people begin to talk in terms of Sheehan's um, conceptualization of the relationship between the individual um, and life and the sort of broader collective. And I have to say, you know, part of the reason why I was drawn to this group of people is because those have always been my questions as a historian. So mm -hmm. I've always written about people, you know, not a small group of people, but like, you know, 30 or 40 individuals in a way that's, I know you do, that's in a book, um, but asking always about, so where does causality lie? So does causality lie inside the family where we actually can't see it, but we have to imagine the aggregation of thousands and thousands and thousands of families making the same decision? Um, and is that a kind of social transformation that has happened before you see a new law being passed or even a political movement happening? So those are, yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. And I think we still sort of grapple um, with these same kinds of questions today. And, you know, I've always kind of joked that, you know, even though some of our colleagues may, um, you know, be dismissive of the importance of the individual and high politics uh, these days as, you know, uh, fashions in the academy, um, they're still gonna wanna know, oh, well, what do you think Trump said to Pence, you know, behind closed doors that those sort of private conversations or even, you know, family, uh, you know, origins and, and those kinds of backgrounds. We don't question that they matter when we're just sort of talking politics and talking about, uh, you know, current events. Um, but somehow, you know, o over the years um, and who knows, I mean, now, the field is so diverse, maybe what seems to me to have fallen from favor is making a comeback <laughs> somewhere else or enjoying David a revival. Bell has, so. Yeah, no, David Bell had a great piece in foreign policy at the start of um, Trump's presidency that was essentially about, you know, what happened to all of us who were interested in, you know, the Annals School and in, you know, deep history, deep time. Um, and now everyone is a historian of events. Right. right. Um, and and actually a, a more serious question beyond that, behind that, which is, and, and the one that these journalists were grappling with, which is you simply could not explain what was happening without the Hitler or the Stalin or the Gandhi or the Nehru for that matter. In other words, they were sitting at a time when they could see how much the individual politician mattered and that you, you couldn't understand what was going on without them. Right. Well, I think about your Time Magazine cover with uh, Dorothy Thompson and, of course, Time's Man of the Year. I mean, for years, decades, I could be wrong, Time Magazine only put individuals on its cover, or maybe not only, but primarily. I mean, that was, you know, and there would be leaders of, you know, foreign countries, you know, Haile Selassie or someone beyond that. Right today, you know, Time Magazine, I don't even know if it still exists in print, but, you know, would not be putting on, you know, the prime minister of Ethiopia on the cover. It's, you know, probably not. 
you know, very few world leaders, um, you know, maybe Putin, but, um, you know, I think there's, there's sort of a shift in how we do journalism too. And that sort of the demise of, you know, so-called great man history um, was not just in history, that there was also kind of a broader sort of cultural shift away from that kind of thinking that has, that sort of encouraged a journalism of um, trends, of, um, you know, these, these broader currents um, th that, you know, uh, are, are, are sometimes quite hard to pin down, but seem to be a kind of substitute for that mid-century uh, uh, focus on these history-making individuals. Yeah. So, I mean, in a way, right, the telling of the Ukraine, the Russia-Ukraine war through Putin and Zelensky as the right. embodiment of the struggle. I mean, obviously, you know, a lot more, we know a lot more about the Ukrainian, um, you know, public opinion, the populace uh, commitments to fight all the rest of that than we can about Russia. But it was striking at the start of the war, especially the ways in which the entire conflict then boiled down to this very personified conflict. Right. And in a way, it felt almost like a throwback in that sense. Um, and people were reaching for older framings, whether it was Cold War or, um, you know, some earlier era, uh, precisely because uh, it seemed like we hadn't had that kind of, um, you know, individual high stakes politics on the international stage uh, uh, in a while. Um, um, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't know when, um, Eric, we should sort of open it up to the questions or if they're um, sort of already lining up in the queue. Um, I want to make sure people have, have time, although there's a lot more I could ask as well. So why don't you ask a few more and uh, then we will segue into the audience. Okay. Um, so let's go to another shared interest we have, which is in the history of, of journalism. And, you know, there's a sort of elegiac note um, in the book that, you know, these folks, I think it's Sheehan says this in a couple of places, uh, you know, we're the last of our kind, or, you know, after us, this mode, this, this form of journalism, uh, won't continue. And in a sense, I think that's right. And you seem to sort of endorse that, Deborah, at the end of the book. But I also think we have seen whether, I mean, there's a wonderful group biography of Halberstam and Neil Sheehan, a different Sheehan, and the, the Vietnam War correspondence that um, was done. Um, we can think sort of in our own times or, you know, recent history of those who went over to uh, Bosnia during that war. And there was a certain kind of um, both popular romance attached to those reporters, as well as, you know, I think a, a role that they played that was not altogether dissimilar to the role that these folks played, not quite on the same scale, but still significant. So. I guess I want to ask you about, you know, were these the last of their kind or, or can we see in other um, generations of brave war correspondents um, at least a continuation of the legacy? Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't, I, Shin is, you know, an, is an elegizer. Um, I don't think that this is the last of the, the, you know, significant work at, by any means that foreign correspondents do. And in fact, you know, they go on during the war and then after the war, as you say, Vietnam, um, on and on and on. Um, and then, of course, in our own day as well, working with many, many fewer resources and uh, much more tied to the editors at the Home Office. I think what she meant was that their style of journalism, which was this essentially personal journalism, um, being written from a moment where the United States was not the global superpower, right, but rather where they were sort of somehow off the map, 
um, of significance, they were themselves people who, who, at least in their young iteration in the 20s and the 30s, who said what they thought, even when it got them into a fair amount of trouble. They were not people who had made their way through a hierarchy of the city office newspaper and then good behavior and then you get sent abroad. They had um, disrupted all of that. And so I think he meant the sort of free spirit or as Dorothy Thompson calls them, they're the outcasts. Whereas later on you would be you know, much more of an establishment character, not least because Jean gets his way, right? Americans really do care about foreign affairs. It's really important who, you know, what the reporter um, put, you know, writes on the front page of the Times or the Post or whatever um, paper. And that they are, they do have a much more establishment remit, much closer contacts to governments, much closer contacts to, you know, business proprietors. So I think that that is what he meant. And as I said, he was an elegizer. Right, um, right. And that's certainly not something that I would endorse. I mean, one thing they did have, of course, it is nostalgic in this moment. What do they have? They have incredible amounts of money. <laughs> um, Knickerbocker manages to spend something like 70,000 US dollars in today's terms in, in a month in Addis Ababa um, when reporting the war. I mean, the kinds of budgets that you know, would make anyone want to weep now. So, the, they lived in a moment of expansion when the voices that you heard, if you were sitting around, you know, certainly in Vienna and Berlin, those were American voices sitting in the reporters' bars. And it's one of the things, and this is a good example to give you, this was a statistic that I learned from Sean Nicholas. Um, you know, the British in the interwar period have a handful of reporters in America covering, this is all British newspapers and the BBC covering the United States really a handful, most of them are in New York, fewer than you know six or seven British reporters covering the United States, all papers, including the BBC. And I remember reading that in something that Sean Nicholas wrote and saying, really, <laughs> is that possible? I was used to the, you know, some of these American newspapers, newspapers that don't exist anymore, would have a stable of reporters. So. Yeah, I mean, right, the, the sheer um, number of papers that, you know, every city had, although, of course, a lot of them relied on syndicated columnists and, you know, sort of the, the uh, you know, people like the reporters you uh, write about. Yeah. And so that, that expanded their reach in a way, um, I mean, we can think about it because of, we have the internet, but you know, it's it's different if you have you know your uh, Des Moines, Iowa paper that is mostly about uh, local news, but then you have Dorothy Thompson in there. That that's that sort of hits you differently, I think. Um, and here we go back to your questions about understanding the audiences that these people had. Um, um, it, it hits you differently from just surfing the web and finding. Oh, here's somebody who's reporting from overseas. Right, right. Yeah, there were very much celebrities and very much brands. And so, and, you know, to, and this goes to the audience as well, together with this incredible volume of publication, there were also the lecture tours, you know, ceaseless lecture touring. That was a way to make a lot of money. And also, of course, to reach audiences across most small towns in the United States. So and they were on the lecture circuit always. It seems to me you don't particularly um, play favorites among them. You kind of give them each their due and see their flaws. But of these four or five, if you include Francis, uh, central figures in your cast of characters, um, were there any who you, came away admiring especially or or alternately feeling least uh, warm toward when you were all done with this? I mean, this is the, you know, who people uh, read sympathetically amongst these five really is a Rorschach test. Yeah. <laughs> and I could pretty much predict what people are going to say by this point. So I 
I didn't play favorites in part because I didn't ever have that biographer's sense of coming to dislike the subjects. I think was one of the advantages of actually coming in with the set of contextual questions, right? right. Is that you, you know, there are ways in which they're creatures of their time, and then they there are ways in which they very much transcend their times and seem to have startlingly modern voices um, and startling modern, startlingly modern preoccupations. Um, so I would say this, which is that reading the letters of Sheehan, that Sheehan is a particularly brilliant letter writer. And I found, you know, in a sense, all the stuff about feeling that he was connected, a kind of lightning rod or tuning fork for the universe's ills, it sounds ridiculous. And certainly his friends thought that it was ridiculous until he turned out to be right a lot of the, case, the time. But I found that idea, which is of course not limited to Sheehan, there are many other people who believe that of themselves, especially I think in the 30s. Um, and there's a whole um, uh, kind of set of um, phenomena that he's trying to understand, or as he says to Dorothy Thompson, people about they're having, it's a conversation about UFOs or maybe a letter exchange about UFOs. And he says, well, people really never do look up. <laughs> So, you know, maybe they're UFOs, but there, there are other people who Sheehan is actually having these conversations with that are about that kind of permeability between the individual soul and all of the people in the universe, which is some version of the 19th century. You know, but how do you, human, humanitarian crusades, how do you awaken the sensibilities of people about those far away who are suffering? Right, oh, that's interesting. I mean, I was gonna, say it sounds like if he was anti-Freudian maybe he wasn't wholly anti-Jungian that there's you yeah. know an not, I, I don't think he's quite as anti-Jungian um and Knickerbocker actually goes and interviews Jung yeah. about Mussolini Hitler etc asking him the question that if there was uh something that both of them wanted in the room between Hitler Mussolini and Stalin who would get it <laughs> <laughs> and, Jung, and he publishes a piece and this is Knickerbocker publishes a piece in Cosmopolitan about that inquiry but you can see again the personalization right yeah right and and again it's the personalization walks a fine line between something that's sort of fun and gossipy and maybe a little silly between something that is actually striving for a certain profundity and a certain insight um and you know again it's sort of i think that it can be both at the same time actually um yeah well fundamentally but, they're struggling right with the with the jewish point which is that if democracy should make the individual leader less significant on the other hand what is going on then i mean what does this actually tell us about the nature of the populace and about the sort of the the fitness of the citizenry and the susceptibility of people. Right, and, and we also see in here kind of more of a sense of, you know, concerns with national character. I mean, there's, there's much more um, readiness to allow concepts like a zeitgeist, like a national character, or certain kinds of generalizations that we tend to flinch from today. Um, could be made more confidently. And it sort of opened up their, their thinking and their writing too, um, in a way that could be quite appealing. Well, should we at this point go to our uh, audience here and uh, take some questions? Excellent idea. Thank you so much, David, uh, for uh, engaging um, uh, with Deborah in that uh, conversation. We've got a couple of people patiently with their hands up uh, and a number of people in the Q&A. And if you're not one of them and you want to be, now's the time to get in line, uh, get in the queue. But Sonia Michelle, uh, a uh, longtime participant in this uh, seminar, has her hand up. She knows the routine. Unmute yourself and then join the conversation. Sonia. Okay, I think I unmuted myself. Yes, you did. I not only know the drill, I know the people. Hi, Deb. Um, and hi, David. Um, 
uh, Deborah, you won't be surprised that this is my question. What difference does gender make in all of this? And by that, I don't mean the fact that Dorothy Thompson was a woman and had to struggle for her position and so forth. But what what difference did it make that she was a, a, you know, a prominent journalist at this time and she was a woman and probably one of the first women to be in a position like this, not just writing, you know, giving home advice or whatever, but writing about international affairs and world affairs and so forth. And did that shape, do you think that shaped the audience's expectation of the way she would cover things or the way she would see things, the fact that she was a woman? And did that then perhaps spread to the others in the group that it sort of opened up this dimension of, of um, the relationship between emotions and reporting? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's a really important question. The, first of all, I think I'd wanna make three points. Um, the first point is that you see the extraordinary latitude that American women by comparison to British women as foreign correspondents have, um, which is not just that they're better ed educated, there are more of them in the universities, right? At this point, this is one of these moments when American women are you know, filling the universities. Um, but also because their papers and their editors don't have the same sort of cozy relationships with uh, government officials as is happening in Britain. There's space for the women to enter. This is a new, fundamentally, you know, there've been war correspondents, of course there've been foreign correspondents, but this is an expanding and a new field and they stream into it, the Americans, not the British. I mean, there are you know, some important British women like Elizabeth Wistman um, and the rest, but they envy their American counterparts, the, the sense of opportunity. So I write about Thompson and about Francis Gunther and about Emily Hahn at the New Yorker, but of course to that you can add Anne O'Hare McCormick and Sigrid Schultz and you know on and on and on, Virginia Cowles, um, on and on and on. Um, I think I would put the question differently uh, slightly differently, actually, which is to what extent do does the emotionalism of the 1930s open up possibilities for them as women? Um, so rather than to what extent do as women do they bring their emotional concerns and sort of make them general? Thompson is a really good analyst of what is going on because she sees how important subjectivity and emotionalism is. But that the same thing is true of Sheehan actually, that he's very able to recognize that what is happening here is not the dispassionate or the sort of anonymous character of politics. And, uh, but rather um, that this is personal. So um, Knickerbocker, for instance, you know, is training to be a psychiatrist, which is the reason why he's sitting in Munich in 1923 after being a newspaper reporter. He decides he's going to become a psychiatrist. And so he's there at the Beer Hall Putsch, <laughs> where he sort of wanders in. But he has an interest in these questions of um, subjectivity and emotionalism. So I think that that is really important. And then conversely, and this is a subject that Madeleine Lugley is working on, that conversely, after the Second World War, when realism, when a sort of dispassion, when a sense that all of this emotionalism has led to just complete and utter disaster, both in the analysts and of course, as well as in the propagators um, of the stuff, that, that the sort of emotionalism of someone like Thompson is completely impossible or Rebecca West for that matter. So there's, or, or Sheehan, so that their, their stars really, um, sink after the Second World War because they have established themselves in a kind of rhetoric that becomes, you know, more or less a no-go area. So I hope that, that that answers it. I see, see would, I guess I shouldn't call on people. Do you want me to respond on the chat? I've got it. Okay. So I'll just go down the list here. Yeah, and absolutely. the next hand that is up is Katrin Schulteis. So Katrin, unmute. There. Okay. Hi, Debbie. Good to see you. Um, so I had a question about psychology. You talk a lot about the importance of the sort of personalization and the breaking down of the barrier between sort of the 
personal and political to use um, to to use a term that is probably not appropriate in this context. But so my question is, what you you use psychology as a sort of analogy in the sense that you know the private personal lives of the correspondents were they regarded them as sort of analogous in some ways to what was going on at the larger political level. So uh, given that, I'm just wondering. What was these these four correspondents? What was their view of the psychology of fascism specifically? I mean, you talked about the rejection of Freudianism, but did they have some concept of obviously it's some kind of mass emotional response? Was that their analysis, or how did psychology, in other words, play into their take on fascism? It's a really good question. I mean, they don't. Um... They don't, so unlike, say, Margaret Mead or Jeffrey Gore, they don't tend to head as directly into national character. Um, they also tend to be mo more focused on the leaders than they are on the masses. Um, and in fact, when they turn to try to explain the masses, you know, some of it is this sort of watered down um, version of what Wilhelm Speckel says, which is that people like, people are looking for leaders, they want to be afraid, they're looking for father figures, this is a disappointed generation, you know, all this sort of stuff that we know from this analysis, but their attention is pretty firmly focused on high politics and on uh, at least the interest of, of these people. I mean, Knickerbocker gets a little bit more into trying to understand what has happened to Germany. And of course, these are people who really know Germany and Austria. I mean, they have lived there for years. It's, you know, they're not just dropping in. They're, it seems to Dorothy Thompson absolutely impossible that the Germans are going to follow a leader like Hitler until it actually happens because her Germany is the Germany of Thomas Mann. Um, and, and Einstein, you know. So they don't, you know, by comparison with this sort of neo-Freudianists, the neo-Freudians that Peter Mandler writes about, they don't tend to go to those kinds of national character, um, big, you know, psychoanalytic moves, or neo-Freudian moves. Thank you. I'm going to exercise co-chair's prerogative to get one of my 200 questions that I'd really like to ask uh, in here. And this has to do with someone you haven't talked much about today, but who's one of your main cast of characters, Francis Gunther. And so this is a book about reporters who took on a world at war, yet they all don't see the war in the same way. Uh, and Francis Gunther, her anti-imperialism and her hostility to the British Empire is so intense in a way that those sentiments don't really manifest in the other cast of characters. Can you say a little bit about her politics in this particular moment? Uh, some of it has to do with India, some of it has to do with her Zionism, um, but she doesn't like the British uh, and she analyzes the world very differently than her husband um, and the other reporters that you write about. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up because one of the things, one of the points I want people to take out of the book is actually as much their disagreements as their shared analysis. So that I've been talking a lot about the shared analysis, but the disagreements are equally important. Francis Gunther is one of these um, very certain and also politically labile people who moves across a whole variety of positions over the course of the 20s and the 30s. So she doesn't come with an animosity towards the British Empire per se. She's sort of, you know, in the Abyssinian war, she thinks fundamentally, she, she doesn't have any sympathies for the Haile Selassie and the, and the Abyssinians against the Italian fascists. She thinks basically this is, you know, the future belongs to the road builders. This is what needs to happen. Her politics though are the, for her the slippage between geopolitical concerns and personal concerns is so vast that her, the register of analysis is constantly ricocheting between these two things so she's a marxist she's a socialist 
She has a very complicated relationship to feminism. She thinks, of course, women should be able to do everything that men should do, but also she wants her husband to be able to dominate her. He's completely unable to do that. In fact, she's the theoretician. She's the person who's full of ideas. And she comes, so, you know, by the start, by the late 30s, now with some experience in India and a um, friendship with Nehru, but also a lot of experience um, so touring around in India, she begins to see the British Empire in a sense as, you know, an abusive formation that she's well outpacing actually some of the Indian nationalists in her analysis. So she's exhorting Nehru, you know, stop being such an, uh, you know, Cantabrigian, stop being such an Oxford man, stop, or a Cambridge man, stop being such a, a ninny, stop being friends with the British liberals, you know, you need to pull your socks up and start to fight for India. Um, at the same time, as Eric rightly says, what unites her politics to campaigns, wartime campaigns that don't make any sense together from the political spectrum, but she's very, she's a leading light in the British, in the, the India League of America. She plays a really crucial role in resuscitating it from its pre-war doldrums. Um, but then she also gets involved in the emergency committee to save the Jewish peoples of Europe, Jabotinsky and the Bergson boys, kind of basically right-wing revisionist um, organization. And what unites both of those campaigns is absolutely her hatred of the British Empire. So if you're interested in Frances Gunther, her 1944 book, which is her only book, Revolution in India, gives a really good sense of her aphoristic, um, you know, untamed uh, form of argument. Thank you. Eileen Boris across the country has a question about why you did not choose Walter Lippmann as one of your journalists. Too much of a columnist, she asks. Yeah, so Walter Lippmann comes into the book in part because he's alternating with Dorothy Thompson um, as a syndicated columnist in the New York Herald Tribune. Um, but he's always somewhat of an armchair man by comparison to the foreign correspondence. And so, and part of what Knickerbocker, Thompson, Gunther, and Sheehan, and, and Francis Gunther as well, are leveraging is their on-the-spotness. And, you know, what's funny about, if you read Lippmann and Thompson together, also imagining for the reader them alternating and some of the letters that Thompson gets really cement this uh, in my mind is the ways in which they're Lippmann is, you know, constantly criticizing uh, Thompson as being, you know, practically unhinged in her emotionalism. And she similarly is critiquing him as, you know, too dispassionate, unable to really sort of forcefully take his stand, too much chin scratching, too much on the one hand, on the other hand. So they're quite fascinating to actually read together. So there's a bit of Lippmann in the book, but um, my core was foreign correspondence. I'm wondering, though, the extent to which uh, the sources um, may play a role here. You have the most incredible uh, collection of sources um, that allows you to explore their professional lives um, and delve into their personal lives on a level, you know, that most biographers would just be absolutely envious of. Um, could you say a little bit about those sources and how these allowed you to actually do what you do in this book? The sources are extraordinary. So just to give you a sense, the Gunther collection is 250, more than 250 boxes. About a half of those are listed online. So if you go to the University of Chicago special um, selections, you'll see what looks like more of a professional um, set of archives that are listed online. There's another 130 something boxes that haven't yet been added to the online catalog. Um, these are sources that are everything from, you know, thousands and thousands of notes taken on little, you know, pastel colored pieces of paper. Um, some of them writing down dreams, some of them writing down a thought that 
you know, Gunther had when he's interviewing the Austrian dictator Dolphus, sometimes the dream and Dolphus <laughs> together in the same note. Um, diaries, correspondence, and this is a group of people who are friends, um, you know, with oftentimes sticky relations with each other, and they work out a lot of their ideas in correspondence because they're rarely in the same place until after the Second World War. Um, and so instead they're writing letters, they're, and then of course, newspaper clippings, you know, volumes and volumes and volumes of newspaper clippings in all of these archives. And then just extraordinary things. I mean, I was, I remember my first time at the Gunther archive, uh, you know, a letter that Jan Maserick writes to John Gunther gossiping about the abdication crisis in Britain, which has just happened. And, you know, this is just something that's sort of by the by there. So they're in contact and in correspondence with most major European journalists, writers, politicians. This is, and this is obviously also a big influence on their work. So, yeah, and then a private archive, you know, private archives of people who are desperately trying to understand why is it that, you know, events are affecting them in this way? Why are they behaving in the way that they are? I say this in the book, but just to re repeat it, which is that there's, they bring the sort of 19th century rationals rationalists attempt to their emotions. So they write so many pages because they're trying to understand what they're feeling. And so you have this perfect combination on the one hand of all of the insights that come and all the questions that come from psychoanalysis. But then on the other hand, you also have the dedication to trying to understand yourself in rational terms, to give an account of the self in rational terms. And that produces also a huge amount of of writing. I mean, that is true of the writing, I think, of a number of queer men. I mean, and for my previous book, Family Secrets, they tended to be the, you know, keep um, 300 volumes of diaries, say. It's the same sort of impulse. Good. David Hollinger poses a question uh, in the Q&A. Two questions, actually. The first is, can you tell us more about how we should understand Thompson's perspective on Zionism? And then secondly, he asks about Nancy Cott, who published a book a few years ago with accounts of Gunther, Sheehan, and Thompson. And he asks if you could tell us uh, how and to what extent your analysis differs from Cott's. Absolutely. So uh, number one, um, Thompson becomes one of um, Israel, the state of Israel's really ardent critics after the Second World War. And her perspective on Zionism is not a lot different from Jimmy Sheehan's perspective on Zionism, which he comes to in 1929 when he is one of the few reporters who is there as the riots begin to happen at the Western Wall. And he, for a variety of reasons, believes, and of course these are issues that are still extremely contentious now, but he believes that this entire conflagration has been somewhat um, set up by um, Zionist agitators. So Sheehan, like Thompson, and also like Gunther, although much less publicly, thinks about Zionism as a, another form of imperialism. And for Sheehan especially, um, you know, an ardent anti-imperialist, this is just, there's very little to distinguish those two. And so Thompson, it's funny, right? Because Thompson, who is one of the very first people to report on attacks against Jews, she's there in 1933 reporting for the Jewish Telegraphic Agency, um, is thought about as a friend of the Jews, someone who is welcomed in Zionist circles. She does a huge amount in sponsoring refugees. She's credited with some of the sort of brain power behind the Evian Conference on refugees. She's writing very um, perspicaciously about refugees. Her attitude towards Israel after the war is really thought of as a betrayal of all of that, but there's a lot of consistency in the anti-imperial um, strain that runs through. Um, and secondly, I was really lucky to be able to, you know, be working alongside and in parallel to Nancy Cott, who's a historian who I, you know, admire immensely. And, a sense what was really interesting. So her book is entitled Fighting Words um, and it was published in 2020. 
And we, I think in a sense, we were coming at the question of this group of Americans, for me as a historian of Europe, um, from a question of a set of European preoccupations. So what did they see by virtue of their Americanist? Um, and, you know, and one of the things that's central for Cott's book is what do they as Americans bring home from the world back to America? So in a way they're sort of paired books, I would, is the way that I would describe them. Thank you. Peter Stansky asks a question and says, this is a wonderful book. There is fascinating presentation uh, of the private lie of, of these journalists, um, sex and so much drinking. Could you say something more about how that interacted and shaped their professional lives? Yeah, I mean, there was, let me say, we've talked a bit about the sex. I might come back to that, but let me talk about the drinking, which we actually haven't said very much about, which is that certainly by our any modern definition, Sheehan and Knickerbocker would both count as straight up alcoholics. I mean, they were drunk drunk a lot of the time. I mean, they, their productivity is of course extraordinary. And Dorothy Thompson also drank quite a lot. Um, for Knickerbocker, um, the drinking does begin, you know, he manages it, uh, you know, as a young man through the twenties and the thirties, it gets really bad in the second world war. And it does eventually interfere with his career. So he is really, he goes missing from um, his paper um, at various crucial moments. Um, I think that, you know, I read the drinking, which is, you know, a kind of persistent feature. I think many foreign correspondents would say, of course, yeah, what's changed? You know, there's plenty of drinking, um, plenty of sex, plenty of drinking. But I think one of the things that's changed that, that, that the drinking sort of points you towards is the incredible anxiety of their position and the terrible, terrible stress of not just, you know, having to file all those stories. Sometimes they're filing three and four stories. They're right in the center. They have all the dilemma of, dilemmas of observers, right? They have all of the, the kind of morally ambiguous position of witnesses, but then, they are also trying to predict what's going to happen next. So it's a very high stakes enterprise. And I think the drinking to me began, you know, to make most sense in that context. Um, I think this, you know, part of what's really interesting about the sex is, you know, they are really living in the world of, um, you know, without firm dichotomies between hetero and homo sex. They, someone like Sheehan is, you know, what is he? Is he um, a repressed homosexual? That is one way that you could interpret him. That's not the way that I see him. I see him as someone who is so open, so alive to the world. He has relations with men. He marries. Um, he has a very, very long relationship with Diana Forbes Robertson, the daughter of an acting family, a, a British woman. Um, Dorothy Thompson herself has a relationship with a woman in addition to her relationships with men. And that there's a way in which, you know, they are really showing us the range of ways of kind of, of thinking about sexual practices. There's a ton of, in the book, and I think Eric is talking about the archives, there's a ton in the book about abortion too, and about the consequences of pregnancies that, you know, attempts to, to stop pregnancies, attempts to use pregnancies, and all of that attesting to the incredible danger, especially for the women in the book, of sexual, this moment of 1920 sexual freedom and all of its consequences. And of course, the European mores, which of course the Americans in the book view is, you know, much better <laughs> than the mores that they're trying to escape back at home um, in American repression. Uh, but it leads them into all sorts of, of dilemmas, entanglements. Thank you. 
going to come back to an early question that Eileen Boris uh, posted uh, a while ago, um, and she finds Gunther's Inside USA, a, a terrific book. It came out before the Cold War dominated everything, uh, but also as the New Deal was being normalized and contested. And she asks about his politics. And I want to kind of piggyback on that. Um, to ask about the larger, you know, kind of political orientation, um, and and Gunther, as he travels the United States, encounters race, um, and possibly for the first time, this becomes an issue that he gets to grapple with. Sheehan at one point uh, gets contacted by uh, Walter White of the NAACP. Uh, and this is after the Second World War. And he says, I got something for you. Come down to Tennessee. You know, there's been racial violence and there's a trial, you know, and so Sheehan goes. And so seeing these folks as liberals in a certain sense, but but race and the status of African Americans in this country, in the context of anti-fascism um, or serving overseas during the Second World War seems to be something that doesn't come into focus for them. Am I wrong in, in seeing that? No, 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 I think it does absolutely come into focus for them. So I think that Sheehan sees the trial. Yes. For and the reason why Walter White calls him is because he thinks that Sheehan is going to be the man who's going to actually be able to link Mm -hmm. all of that reporting on anti-Semitism and on discrimination to the, because Sheehan by this point is really well known as an anti-colonial. So it begins with his reporting in the Moroccan wars, as I said, when he takes up the cause of Abdul Krim, the Rifi leader, nationalist leader, um, and continues on. I mean, Sheehan also has a long entanglement with Nehru. Um, and so when White calls him, he thinks Sheehan is going to be sympathetic. He's going to be the man who can actually see what the structures of racist violence look like. And, and Sheehan delivers that so that the articles he writes then lead the, the um, Herald Tribune to publish an editorial saying, you know, there's a continuity here between what the Nazis are doing and what is happening here in the American South. So, and then the same thing is true for Gunther. So he very explicitly says in the Inside USA, that the system of racial segregation that he sees is worse than what he has seen in Poland. Um, so they're very skilled at using those kinds of European analogies. Dorothy Thompson actually makes a number of analogies to what she thinks about Viennese social democracy and about the, the kind of social democratic red Vienna that is built after the first world war um, to American uh, social programs. And so I think, you know, part of what they're doing, and this is, you know, maybe comes back to David's question, um, Hollinger's question as well about, um, you know, what do I think that my book is doing is, I think seeing them as the part of an information system that is linking America to Europe, but also to Asia, and that that, you know, they're both entrusted with information, they're reporting information, they're making analogies. The foreign reporting that they're doing is kind of taking root in their domestic analysis. Fundamentally, they all become book reporters, right? They all become book journalists and that that's something really important that's happening. Thank you. Christian, you have a final question for us? Well, we, we, we should end at, at 5.30, but let me just, my, my question really, um, uh, focuses on on your on your writing. I wonder if coming at your subject as a story, not a biographer, nonetheless, in writing this group biography, did you have to? What were challenges? What were the challenges in writing? Um, uh, how do you have to uh, improve or advance on earlier books, earlier writing yeah. in doing this book? As a final so question, that, it's a really good question, and I think that there are two things. One of them was that because I heard their voices in those archives that I wanted the reader to hear them as well. And so what I tried to do is something is use a kind of close third person so that you can hear them speaking. And so that was a big trial because it was difficult to, and this goes back to the questions we started with, it was difficult to get the balance between 
what is the you know what's the geopolitical story what's the personal story what's the kind of the mm -hmm. about their work and the, the the kind of intellectual work that they're doing especially at the middle market um and then i think that the so i wanted you to hear their voices and so i use I, I tried to trace a trajectory where you can sort of feel the wised up flapper um insouciant beginning and then the kind of um end you know which is is much much more sober in terms of the language so to make the form of the book actually match the the narrative arc mattered and then there was another thing which i my colleague here amy stanley um gave me a really great podcast that was about managing multiple uh figures in a narrative and it was actually a screenwriter's podcast because screenwriters have this problem all the time like how do you you know Sheehan is not in this chapter how does he not just kind of completely sink out of the reader's view so you know some of those kinds of technical things yeah. but that was all interesting great thank you thanks Christian's given us our marching orders. Our time, alas, is up. We could go on for quite some time. So I want to thank Deborah Cohen and David Greenberg, who has had to leave because he has a class and he has to teach and he has to get across campus uh, to do so. So Deborah, David, and Christian, uh, my thanks to you for this very stimulating discussion. Christian, thank back to you. Thank you again for having me. And to all of the people who have been listening, thank you, thank you, and for the questions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah, David, uh, in absentia, and, and Eric. Uh, really, really wonderful conversation. Just a reminder to join us next week, but not Mondays, on, thir on Thursday, October 13, for a conversation about a new biography of Golda Meir, as always, at 4 p.m. With that, uh, we're already over time. We're adjourned. Stay safe. Uh, good night. Thank you.